What's up guys, welcome back to this series on reinforcement learning. In this video, we'll continue our discussion of deep Q networks, and as promised from last time, we'll be introducing a second network called the target network into the mix. We'll see exactly how this target network fits into the DQN training process. So let's get to it. Recall from last time that we left off with this summary that describes the training process of a DeepQ network. We briefly mentioned that there were some issues that could arise from this approach though. These issues come into play in the step where we calculate the loss between the output Q values and the target Q values. Remember, this is the step that requires a second pass to the DeepQ network, otherwise known as the policy network. As a quick refresher, remember for a single sample, the first pass to the network occurs for the state from the experience tuple that was sampled. The network then outputs the Q values associated with each possible action that can be taken from that state, and then the loss is calculated between the Q value for the action from the experience tuple and the target Q value for this action. To calculate the target Q value though, we were required to do a second pass to the network with the next state. From this second pass, we can obtain the maximum Q value among the possible actions that can be taken from that next state, and then plug this value into the Bellman equation to calculate the target Q value for the action from the first pass. This process is a bit of an earful, I know, so if you're struggling at all, be sure to spend some time on the previous video where we cover this in full detail. Alright, now that we have that refresher out of the way, let's focus on the issues with this process. As mentioned, these issues stem from the second pass to the network. Okay. Ow. We do the first pass to calculate the Q value for the relevant action, and then we do a second pass in order to calculate the target Q value for this same action. Our objective is to get the Q value to approximate the target Q value. Remember, we don't know ahead of time what our target Q value even is, so we attempt to approximate it with the network. This second pass occurs using the same exact weights in the network as the first pass. Given this, when our weights update, our outputted Q values will update, but so will our target Q values since the targets are calculated using the same weights. So our Q values will be updated with each iteration to move closer to the target Q values, but the target Q values will also be moving in the same direction. As Andong put it in the comments of the last video, this makes the optimization appear to be chasing its own tail, which introduces instability. As our Q values move closer and closer to their targets, the targets continue to move further and further because we're using the same network with the same weights to calculate both of these values. Well, here's a perfect time to introduce the second network that we mentioned earlier. Rather than doing a second pass to the policy network to calculate the target Q values, we instead obtain the target Q values from a completely separate network, appropriately called the target network. The target network is a clone of the policy network. Its weights are frozen with the original policy network's weights, and we update the weights in the target network to the policy network's new weights every certain amount of time steps. This certain amount of time steps can be looked at as yet another hyperparameter that we'll have to test and tune to see what works best for us. So now, the first pass still occurs with the policy network. The second pass, however, for the following state, occurs with the target network. With this target network, we're able to obtain the max Q value for the next state, and again, plug this value into the Bellman equation in order to calculate the target Q value for the first state. This is all we use the target network for. To find the value of this max term, so that we can calculate the target Q value for any state passed to the policy network. As it turns out, this removes much of the instability introduced by using only one network to calculate both the Q values as well as the target Q values. We now have something fixed, i.e. fixed Q targets, that we want our policy network to approximate, so we no longer have the dog chasing its own tail problem. Clever fox. As mentioned though, these values don't stay completely fixed the entire time. After X amount of time steps, we'll update the weights in the target network with the weights from our policy network, 
which will in turn update the target queue values with respect to what it's learned over those past time steps. This will cause the policy network to start to approximate the updated targets. All right, so now let's just highlight what's changed in our training summary since we've introduced this target network. For the most part, this is all the same. We only have a few tweaks. The first change is that we now have a new step at the start where we clone the policy network and call that clone the target network. Additionally, when we calculate the loss between the Q value outputs from the policy network and the target Q values, we do this using the new target network now rather than with a second pass to the policy network. The last change is just that we update the target network weights with the policy network weights every X time steps. Take some time to go over this new algorithm and see if you now have the full picture for how target networks fit into the DeepQ network training process. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And also, please leave a thumbs up to let us know you're learning and be sure to check out the corresponding blog to this video as well as the Deep Lizard Hive Mind for exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence and I'll see you in the next one. A paradigm shift has taken place in the field of artificial intelligence. Today, the action is really around machine learning. So rather than handcrafting knowledge representations and, and features, we create uh, algorithms that learn, often from raw perceptual data, uh, basically the same thing that the human infant does. The result is AI that is not limited to one domain. The same system can learn to translate between any pairs of languages, or learn to play any computer game at the uh, Atari console. Now, of course, AI is still nowhere near having the same powerful cross-domain ability to learn and plan as a human being has. The cortex still has some algorithmic tricks that we don't yet know how to match in machines. But so the question is, how far are we from being able to match those tricks? <laughs>